Good morning. Boy, that was an exciting response. <laughs> you got your Bible, turn to uh, the book of John. Now they had, uh, they had in our list of things we were going to do, it said special music, so I'm not sure if I should get up here and sing. Or, uh, you can't. I did once. Yep, it's on. Always like to get off to a good start. <laughs> Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> All right. After no further delay, uh, I felt like going to the book of John this week, and it's, it, it's interesting because in studying for the morning service and the evening service this week, why uh, uh, I was drawn to water for different reasons, and uh, they were in, in John, and we're going to start actually in John 129 and kind of get a running start to this. So if you've got your Bible, I know I don't have any, any deal up here on the uh, uh, board, but uh, I kind of like to just do it the old-fashioned way and just, uh, just go through the Bible together. Uh, I'm with King, New King James, so if uh, uh, you, you, your, your version will be pretty close. Mine will be anointed. Yours will be pretty close. If, <laughs> let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer ask Him to bless this time. Father, uh, this is all about you and certainly not about me or about uh, my performance here, which is good because we want you to be glorified in all we do. We pray that you would take the Word and that you would apply it to our hearts and apply our hearts to your service. We ask that you bless what's said here this morning in Christ's precious name. Amen. Uh, in the first chapter of John, Jesus has, uh, ha- has uh, it just been introduced by John, and, he's, and what follows in this first chapter is his, is his baptism. Interesting, he walks 80 miles to be baptized to begin his public ministry. And so he goes to the Jordan River to be baptized, and uh, the cool thing about it, when you look at Scripture, when you get all the, uh, the, the um, uh, first four Gospels together, you find that God the Father, God the Son, God, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all present there. And that's kind of exciting. And uh, so we start in verse uh, 29 in chapter 1, and it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Well, it's interesting, as you know, that, that John and, 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 and Jesus were cousins, and uh, in, in the earthly sense they were cousins, and John was about six months older than Jesus. But he makes it very clear here, for the first time as God showing him, not only is this somebody that was related to me, but this is Yeshua HaMashiach, this is the Messiah. And so uh, he was before me. He's always been. I did not know him, but when he should be revealed to Israel, therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I love this. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So the first day after his baptism, Jesus uh, begins to gather disciples. You see, his public ministry, he had to fulfill every area of the law. Two areas in the Old Testament says that a priest is called into active service from ages 30 to 50. And uh, so we know he's 30 because he came to fulfill every portion of the law, and and he's, he's ready for public ministry. And the first thing he does is he gathers disciples, verse 35 of that same chapter. Again the next day... John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples, the disciples of John, heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and, and, and uh, Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? And, and basically saying, they say, Where are you staying, uh, uh, Rabbi? Because they want him to be their rabbi. They've been following John and John's ministry, but they've just seen Messiah, been told where Messiah is, and they want to be at his feet. And so as good servants of the rabbi, where are you staying? Uh, we're yours now. We're going to follow you, and, 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 and you're going to lead us into all truth, if you will. Now, uh, let's see. 
Uh, one of the two who heard John speak, verse 40, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found Messiah. How many of us, when we realized that Jesus was the Lord and we wanted to be saved and we came to Christ and, 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 and we had our salvation secure, worried about family first? I mean, that's just kind of the way it is, isn't it? I can remember Betty, she got saved about three months before me. My head doesn't fit this thing. And... Uh, so she, was, she, she put off getting saved because she didn't want to get saved without me. And I believe there's a lot of people like that that, that we, want to, uh, we, we want our mates and the people we love to know Jesus as well. And, and so he goes, to, he goes to find Simon Peter. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found Messiah, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated... A stone. That's the first day. Second day, more disciples. Uh, Jesus was going to Galilee, and he finds Philip, and, and calls Philip to walk with him. And verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now he says Nazareth there. Can any good thing come out of Netzer, Little Branch, the place where the Romans uh, bivouac station is? Not a good town at all. Can anything come out of there? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Come and see. Good response, isn't it? So now we've reached the third day and we're at chapter 2. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 2. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Now remember, the disciples, as they follow him, they're just kind of going to stay with him because they're going to learn like they would do with the rabbis, whoever they were. And uh, when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to, him, to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Now think about this. If you're Mary and the Holy Spirit has worked to provide Jesus through your body. You know, the, the sin comes through the man, uh, the, the blood comes through the woman, and so she's all human, no sin, and all God. He's all human and he's all God. But since that date, don't you know in a small town there's going to be a lot of rumors go around? And don't you know that Mary knows that this is Messiah, he's, he's been baptized, he's, he's ready to begin his public ministry, and she wants to help him get underway. Did you ever have a mother like that, wants to help you every chance she gets? And he says, my time has not yet come, because everything he did uh, would have been with the timing, the perfect timing of God. And uh, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now they're set with six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. That's about 180 gallons of water that uh, they use for purification. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. If you're the servant, and... <laughs> And you filled the water pots to the brim, and now he says, take that water and put it in the serving vessel for the master of the feast. How are you going to feel as you're walking that, that serving vessel full of water to the master of the feast? What? <laughs> Aren't you going to feel like, I'm in real trouble, and, and then as it pours out, it's like, wow. But I can tell you one better than that. It's when God puts on your heart to say something, to minister something to somebody, and you say, man alive, this, this is nothing. Man, I, I don't know if I helped him or not. And then for some reason, God uses your words or your testimony or your actions, and he causes a miracle to happen right before your eyes. And somebody gets saved or, or renews their walk with the Lord or whatever it might be, but God uses what seems very natural to touch a life and he uses you to do it it's an exciting thing if you've never if you've never had the privilege of talking to somebody about the blessed hope of Jesus Christ and having them bow their heads there is just nothing much like it because you think to yourself I I don't know if I'm said enough to bring them to that place but you see you're just the vessel through which it works that's all that servant was and then God does a miracle and you get to watch a living miracle happen right before you uh, so anyway, they, they uh, draw up some, they took it, verse 9, When the master of the feast had tasted the water that, that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who drew the water knew, 
The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests are well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. And this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And I don't know who the servants were. They're not mentioned by name, but I will, would imagine that there's two new disciples, wouldn't you? They have seen God do a miracle, and they say, yes, this is Messiah. This is the Christ. Uh, we can draw so many illustrations from all this. And uh, I, wanna, I just want to talk about our nation and about Israel at the same time. You see, Israel is a very religious place. I mean, they had three feasts a year. They were required to travel no matter where they lived back to the feast. They had... They had they, <laughs> They couldn't do anything without the church, they, if you will, the called out assembly. They couldn't do anything, and Jerusalem was the center of everything they did. They were religious, and here they are, Messiah's in the midst, and they don't even know him. And they've been praying for him to come, and they don't even know him. Uh, in, in chapter 1, uh, John the Baptist had said, There stands one among you whom you know not. I mean, this, this nation was religious as it can be, and they're having this wedding feast, which is a week-long feast, and, and, and wine is, the, is a symbol of joy and hope for the new wedding, and if, if there's no wine and there's no, uh, they, they don't replace it, then it's like the, this wedding is going to be a bust from the start, you know? But they're there and they're going through all the religious stuff, religious stuff. Most of us have been religious before we got saved. There was a, when I grew up, and, and, and a number of you, when you grew up, the, the getting to church on, you know, twice a year, we were as regular as clockwork, you know. Uh, uh, we, we would celebrate Easter and Christmas uh, and, and, and other times, but the point is that we were religious, but we didn't have a Savior. We didn't have the Master. We were looking forward. We knew all, all that we should do, but, but He wasn't there yet. And, and so this feast is a picture of the nation. They're under a tough time. The Romans are in charge, although they refuse to admit it. And, and their wine is run out. Their, their supply was empty. And here's Messiah right in the midst. And, and, and see, these six water pots that Jesus used was part of the ceremonial cleansing. Now, these people, when, when they use water, man, they use water. If you're a rabbi, uh, you've got sleeves that hang down the next week someplace, and they tie those together and get them up and throw them over their head, kind of like I'm trying to do with this wire that keeps coming out. And, uh, and then whenever they would take a bite, they would, they would sit there and wait for one of their servants to pour water on their hands, a, a sign of cleansing. And they would do this again and again. Like, can you imagine an eight-course eight, eight meal? And seven days of that, and what your couch is going to look like at the end of that time, because they all sit in a couch, watch TV. No, wait a minute, that's us. Uh, they're, they're sitting around a table, and, and well, listen, I'll, I'll read it to you in Mark 7, 3. Listen to this. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. There it is, religious tradition. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. Uh, there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. I mean, they do a lot of ceremony with holding up their hands and letting people wash, uh, uh, dump water all over them. So the, the stone pots, uh, they're, they're part of the ceremonies that everybody's used to. And, 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 but the Jewish ceremonies couldn't help. The nation was spiritually bankrupt. They were without joy. And they're out of oil, wine, that's for sure. And wine is, is a sign of joy in the Bible if you go to Psalm 104. And without hope. Uh, they had all these external ceremonies, but they had nothing to satisfy them within. Uh, uh, Christ will one day bring joy to Israel. We're told that when they receive Him as their King. And, and you note that the wedding took place on the third day. Now that means history is run for two days. Second Peter 3.8 says... A, a, a thousand years with God is as one day. So the third day is approaching when, when Christ returns. That third day will dawn and Israel will be wedded to her God according to Isaiah 54 and Hosea 2. Then the wine of joy will run freely and Christ's glory will be revealed. But until that day, Christ must say to Israel, like he says here in verse 4, What have I to do with you? Uh, the nation has rejected him and because of that, we Gentiles have been given the privilege to know him and to serve Him, and to learn to love Him. Uh, the, the second part of this that I, I thought was, would be fun to do this morning, 
you are having fun, aren't you? Amen, Brother Palmer. We're having a ball. <laughs> There's some lessons here to be learned. You know, uh, if we're saved, what are we called to do when we're saved? We're called to serve, are we not? That's all those servants were called to do was to serve. We serve something in the flesh, a, a fleshly thing, and it becomes a spiritual thing when Christ intercedes. And I want to talk to you about some things that, that, that are very common here. The first thing that we have in common with Israel is there's a, there was a thirsty crowd out there. They were out of wine. And don't you think that's a picture of the world today without Jesus? Without hope, without a tomorrow. Uh, you can enjoy pleasure for a season. You, you, can, uh, you, can, you can just eat it up, but you'll never, it doesn't satisfy, and it will eventually run out, much like wine had. And the, the Bible invites thirst, thirsty sinners to come to price for salvation and satisfaction. But that's the first thing, a thirsty crowd. The second thing that we're going to look at is empty water pots. And according to Scripture, that's a picture of the human heart. Uh, that the heart without Christ is hard and empty, and the Word of God compares it to a vessel. And uh, this, the sinner's life can look pretty lovely on the outside, but um, you know, man wor- looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. He knows where we're at. God sees it as empty and hard, uh, and, and hard without Christ. Hopeless without a divine miracle of God, empty water pots. Third thing, filled with water. Now, in Scripture, water is, is a type of purifying, a picture of the Word of God, washing by the water of the Word. That's how we grow, we're told, and how we're convicted through the Holy Spirit of things in our lives. All the servants had to do was fill the water pots with water, but that's a servant of God filling hearts uh, of unbelievers with the Word of God. It's, by the way, it's not our job to save souls. That's up to God. I have planted a polished watered God gave the increase. But, but our job is to, to, to give people the word and let Christ perform the miracle of salvation filled with water. And then the fourth thing, water into wine. When a sinner's heart is filled with the word, then Christ can perform the miracles that perform, uh, transform him and, and bring joy. Uh, when we were in college, uh, we went with an evangelist one summer, and I thought if I, if I traveled with an evangelist, I would become spiritual. Well, you see how that worked out. But anyway... Uh, we would go out and we're knocking doors every day. We'd set up three tents and then we'd go out and we'd knock doors and we'd be in an area starting churches and it was, it was, it was exciting, but I had practiced and practiced and practiced to lead somebody to Christ. And we went to a, a house where a young girl answered the door and, and uh, I had told her, uh, you know, I was talking to her, you know, uh, uh, she was eating a sandwich, as I recall, and I said, if you were to choke and die off of that sandwich, do you know where you'd spend eternity? And she began to cry, and I thought, your mother must be a horrible cook. But I uh, said, would you like to know? And she says, yes, I would. I'd, I'd like to know. And then I realized that I'd forgotten how to start that thing because I was nervous. So I said, well, well, well uh, my partner here will, will tell you how to do it. You know, so, so I got to see it done, but I'd never yet done it. But uh, uh, when, when, when the miracle comes, it, it brings joy. It, it, it transforms. Acts 8, where where uh, uh, Philip is, is, is the evangelist and he's having a, a, an awesome time of people getting saved and all that and God says I want you to leave all this and I want you to go to the backside of the desert and there will be a fellow that you can minister to and so he goes and he finds that Ethiopian fellow and he's reading the word and can't understand it do you know what you read? no sir not unless somebody tells me and, and so he, he reads it to him and he gives him the word and the miracle of salvation happens you, believe, you remember and and the Ethiopian went his way rejoicing. And uh, in, in the first chapter of John, it, it says this. It says, the law came through Moses. And in the Old Testament, the first one of the first miracles was where water was turned into blood, which, uh, which spoke of wrath and judgment. Let my people go. I'm not going to let your people go. You will, but it's going to take a few miracles. Well, we'll take the gods of Egypt and we'll cause them to, to uh, uh, curse you instead of bless you. And, but here, Christ turns the water into wine, and that speaks of grace and joy. And, and then this happened the third day. When you think of the third day in, in Christian thought, what do you think of? You think of the resurrection, don't you? How Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried. He rose again a third day according to the Scripture. That's the gospel. And uh, then here's the sixth thing, and I like this. It's the beginning of miracles, it says in this Scripture. The beginning of miracles. And isn't that what salvation is? Isn't that when it all begins? Is, is when a person comes to Christ. You and I have been operating on the fleshly side our entire lives until Jesus. That's just the truth. 
And there's another side that's, that, that's, that just doesn't get enacted until you come to Christ. And then all of a sudden, if you're like I was, my grandparents had me reading the Bible when we go to their house at Christmas time or in the summertime. But when I got saved, it was like it was a brand new book. The, the scriptures that I'd read before, all of a sudden they had new meaning. And now every time you get into the Word, the Word just comes alive because the miracle of God has changed my seeing. I've actually got spiritual eyes. Am I a spiritual giant? Not by any stretch of the imagination, but God lets me see things that I can't see until He comes into my heart and gives me life. Uh, salvation, the beginning of miracles, after person's saved. Uh, uh, miracles are one after another, and most of them we don't even see. It's God's hand of protection. It's His, it's His, it, it's His, it's hedge of protection around us that sometimes we don't even see. But uh, it all brings glory to God if it's His miracle, and that's the important thing. And uh, if you're like I am, there's times that we need to practice a little more giving God glory for what He's doing in our lives with other people because, uh, like it or not, folks are watching us. And, uh, and uh, some of the things we say might draw them a little closer to the Lord. You know, what makes them different? Well, it's Jesus Christ. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what makes you different. And then there's a, le a practical lesson in this, as there is in everything. Uh, how to serve Christ. And I think the most important words that Mary spoke, she spoke very few words in the Bible, but right here, how important. Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, we close every service with an invitation. Is that about right? And the invitation is, if you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, we're not there yet, I'm just telling them what's going to happen. i got about 45 more minutes before we get there. It, uh, don't get up, I'm just kidding. Uh, but... At that time, if you've not accepted Christ as your personal Savior, if there's that emptiness in your heart that only Christ can fill, that's the time when we invite you to come forward. And uh, that, that's the Holy Spirit, by the way, speaking to you, not the preacher. He takes the words, which are pretty empty, and, and He gives them life to you. He, he quickens your spirit, Scripture says. You begin to, you begin to be convicted about things, and, and you realize, man, I'm, if you realize you're lost then the next thing is for you where the Holy Spirit says you need to go forward and if you're like I was you'll say no I don't and, 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 and maybe the person that's invited you here this morning that came with you that's excited you've come this far finally got you in church the, the, the ceiling didn't fall in the, 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 the church didn't explode and here you are and, and they're thinking Lord Jesus this is my friend and I don't want to see them spend an eternity in hell please this morning Lord Jesus bring them to saving grace and you know what's exciting about it? You're there sitting there saying, I know I need to get saved, I'm not going to do it. You remember those times. And sometimes if that person is there and the Holy Spirit's not only saying pray for them, He's saying go with them. And so somebody comes and touches your arm perhaps and said, I don't know, God's put on my heart. You want to go forward? I'll go with you. You know, that kind of stuff works. It's the miracle of salvation. Whatever He says to you, do it. That's the idea. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. And he speaks differently to us. Somebody over here might say, uh, I'll, I won't point at anybody in particular. Somebody might say, well, well, I want you to quit gossiping. And you say, you know, I, I want to quit gossiping. And I'm going to tell my best friends how much I want to quit today. Uh, so it may seem foolish for the servants, don't you think, to fill the water pots? But God uses his foolish things to confound the Almighty, or the mighty according to 1 Corinthians 1.27. You invited somebody they came. Step one. You encourage them, you talk to them, you, you hope that God will speak to their heart. But when they do, be available to be a blessing to them beyond that. Uh, if we see men saved, we, we must obey Christ and give people the Word of God. It, it's not, you know, entertainment's good. I love to have a good time. I know I hide it, but I love to have a good time. But, you know, that, doesn't, that, that isn't what wins people to Christ. It's not, or it's not recreation. Recreation is fun, used to be, when, when I could do it. But uh, that doesn't bring souls into the kingdom. What brings souls into the kingdom, according to God? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? By the Word of God. And so when we come together, there, there, there are several important factors happening here. We took a, a scripture that basically everybody knows, and we said, God, use this scripture to not just be words and time spent, but put conviction on people's hearts. Show them where they're at. And there will probably be one or two people here that have never accepted Christ. 
and, and, and they're thinking, yeah, I know I need to get saved. And then the big but comes, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're fighting with the Holy Spirit. But, but, but you see, it's the Word of God. It's, it's the power of the Spirit of God that, that puts that conviction on your heart. Uh, so if we do our part, I have planted, Apollos watered. Who gives the increase? God gives the increase. Uh, the, suv- the servants knew where the wine came from, but uh, the important people certainly didn't know. And, and when, Christ, when a man serves Christ, he learns Christ's secret. That's, that's the most amazing thing to me, that God will put on your heart things that uh, he shows you because he loves you. You know, he said, uh, he told his disciples, he said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And one of the things that draws people to a place like this is when it's just like joining the family, you know? It, it, it's because people love you here. Why do they love you? The, the, the love of Christ constrains us, draws us together. We are living stones bound together by the love of Christ. And so it, it would, second, second appeal, if, if you're not uh, part of a church, you need to get in where God's Holy Spirit works with people around you as well. And it's, it's a wonderful place to be because it's part of the family of God. And so uh, would you stand with me and close your, close your eyes, please? And I want to... Something I've not done in a service for a while that I would like to do. I, I, don't know if, I don't know what brought you here this morning other than I believe the Spirit of God is working. And I would encourage you this morning that uh, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to forgive your sins, you're a sinner, you know. We're all sinners saved by grace or not saved by grace. But if, you've asked, uh, if you'd like to ask Jesus Christ to save you this morning, I, uh, let's, let's pray together. And, and if you've never prayed that prayer, here's all you need to say is, Our Father... I know I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. Lord Jesus, I know that you want to come into my heart. I want you to do that right now. Come into my heart. Save me. From this moment forward, by your power and your presence, may I live for you and bring joy to your heart. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, most everybody may have repeated with me or not, but if you've never repeated that prayer before, we're going to give an invitation, a couple of of verses. And if God has spoken to your heart, I would encourage you to come forward and make a public profession. And that's where that person that's a friend is really handy to have along, because they'll go with you to come down here and do that. Uh, have Have you seen a baptism go on here? We've had them regularly recently, and isn't it exciting when it happens? You know what they do first thing when he gets up there or she gets up there? And, and, uh, and if it's a little kid, they have to hold him up so you can see him. But uh, they say, have you given your heart to Jesus? Have you been saved? And they'll say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh, and then they'll say what? They'll say, uh, uh, in accordance to your profession, I baptize you, my little brother, my little sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, hopefully they don't say all that while you're underwater, but they put you under, bring you back up. Now, so what was the first thing you did? You gave a public profession. That's what you do when you come forward, by the way. You give a public profession. Hey, guys, I just gave my heart to Jesus. And I want you to know that I'm going to need a lot of prayer (laughs) because I got a lot of changing, and God's going to have to do a lot in my life. But see, that's that public testimony. And if God's done that for you this morning, if, if, if you've asked him to save you, I would encourage you to come forward. And maybe you're searching for a church. Hey, you're in luck. This is a church, a called-out assembly of believers who love God and love people. We'd love to have you be a part. We're going to do about two verses of invitation. And uh, if God's spoken to your heart, would you come forward this morning as we sing?